Hi there and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar, Dual Channel RTK for UIS, State of the Art in Science and Capabilities and Benefits, sponsored by Inside GNSS, Trimble, and Inside Unmanned Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dierman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they address the latest in the art and science of this dual channel RTK technology and how to benefit the most when integrating guidance, navigation, and control systems for a wide variety of UAS platforms. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the pre presentation during the Ask the Expert panel session with all of our panelists. Now we've invited you along with over 320 professionals from around the globe representing a variety of industries and over the next 90 minutes regardless of your industry segment or location we are confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Now before we get started Richard Fisher publisher inside GNSS and inside unmanned systems would like to take a moment to welcome you and introduce General Poss who will be moderating the main portion of today's webinar. So at this point over to you Richard. Thanks so much, Lori. Uh, on behalf of the Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems team, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our international audience uh, for today's webinar. We're delighted everybody can join us today. In just a few minutes, our panel of experts will take us from the theoretical to the very practical to the state of the art. And now I'd like to introduce our sponsor, Joe Carey of Trimble Integrated Technologies. Joe. Thanks, Richard. I'd like to add my welcome to everybody in the audience. On behalf of Trimble, I'm really pleased that we're able to sponsor this webinar. Trimble's mission is to transform the way the world works. UAVs are helping to do that, and in many cases, they can do it better with the benefit of precision GNSS. I'm excited about the panel we've been able to put together. They're all experts, and we'll be hearing about both the how and why of precision GNSS in the context of unmanned systems. There's something for everybody in these presentations. We'll touch on some of the foundational principles of GNSS and RTK, as well as some more advanced topics. So thanks again, Richard. Let's get started. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot, Joe. Uh, we're delighted to have you as a sponsor. Now I wanna to turn to uh, the webinar over today's uh, moderator, General James Poss. General Poss is the CEO of ISR Ideas and Intelligence Unmanned Aerial systems and cyber warfare consulting firm. Uh, he's the founder and former executive director of the Alliance for System Safety of UAS through Research Excellence, uh, otherwise known as Assure. Uh, he is a leading expert on UAS, having helped design the U.S. Air Force's remote split operation system uh, for, UA for UAS control and the distributed common ground for UAS intelligence analysis. Uh, we're delighted that General Poss can join us today. General Poss, the floor is yours, sir. Richard, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And, you know, i got to tell you what, before we start, I just well, want to mention uh, that we're uh, thinking about the uh, 2,996 uh, civilians killed and 6,000 injured from 90 different countries on 9-11. And I think it's uh, very apropos that we're, uh, we're talking about this uh, subject that is uh, so important to... Um, you know, the future of the world when we're talking about some bad things that happened to us in the past. Okay, now that said, um, yeah, I got to tell you, you're, you're literally talking to uh, the, the Fred Flintstone of uh, precision GPS, of uh, precision navigation. Uh, you know, I got into the Air Force, uh, the actual data is classified, it's in the early 80s, um, I'm not as old as I look. But, um, you know, back in the day, the Air Force uh, navigated using uh, the extremely accurate uh, uh, dead reckoning and occasionally radar and really it wasn't until the uh, the mid 80s that we got into good old fashioned uh, GPS and back in the day uh, which really wasn't that long ago uh, we used to consider a really 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 good GPS fix to be about nine meters uh, yeah, maybe down to three meters on a really good day, uh, which was great for us because uh, for the Air Force, uh, that meant that uh, uh, GPS guided munitions would hit generally within the length of the bomb that we were dropping. 
totally changed uh, warfare. I'll be honest with you, totally changed our, our response to 9-11, to which was our, our first uh, real uh, coordinate-seeking weapon, GPS-guided weapons war. But keep in mind, all of the stuff uh, that we achieved after 9-11 uh, you know, was done with that on a good day, uh, three three meter accuracy. Um, <clears throat> and I'll be honest with you, I, I thought that would have been good enough for uh, civilians. I know that uh, it was a great debate in the Air Force when we decided to release the codes that would allow civilians to uh, to get precision uh, navigation, uh, just like the Air Force had, and also get that three meter code. Imagine my surprise um, when I really started digging into this webinar and, uh, you know, talking with uh, folks like Jay Tilly and Visual Intelligence uh, to find that uh, really the accuracy that you guys are talking about with RTK dual channel systems is, is not three meters anymore. It's more like three centimeters and, and below, sometimes down to the millimeter level. So I've been absolutely fascinated. Uh, learning from these guys, and Inside Unmanned has uh, really, um, Inside GNS has really uh, produced a fantastic panel for this. Uh, first off, we got Stuart Riley, who's the Director of Engineering for Trimble. Uh, he's going to go into some of the ins and outs of uh, dual channel RTK and from a technical level to explain how they get that fantastic accuracy. Then we've got Howard Laven. Uh, from one of my favorite companies, uh, Micropilot Incorporated, uh, one of the world's leaders in making uh, autopilots uh, for drones. And uh, he's going to explain uh, the aviation applications of a really, really accurate dual channel RTK. And then finally, we got uh, Jay Tilly, who's CTO for Visual Intelligence. It's got an absolutely fascinating um, example of how you can use um, uh, dual channel RTK to get uh, you know, millimeter level accuracy out of sensors in 3D. So I'm really looking forward to this, Lori. All right. So uh, shall we get started with our first poll, General Paz? All right. It sounds good. Here we Coming go. up on the screen, this is our first poll here. We'd like to hear from each of you. And in this case, you can select all that apply, but we're going to ask on the honor system to give us your top two. Question is, what qualities of a position can be improved by using a dual or triple band L1, L2, L5 RTK system versus an L1 only RTK system. And your choices, as you see them there, are acquisition time, accuracy, better tracking, effectiveness of error resolution. L1 RTK is good enough. OK, 52% um, saying acquisition time, 85% accuracy, 44 better tracking, 56 effectiveness of error resolution, and 4% saying L1 RTK is good enough. Uh, General Poss, any thoughts? Uh, yeah. So I was going to go out and buy a L1 RTK receiver. I guess this just talked me out of it. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, um, you know, because I kind of uh, put the uh, error resolution and accuracy in the same uh, the same barrel. I, I really thought we would have gone with uh, more acquisition time. But I guess, you know, thinking about it, uh, you know, once you got a fix, uh, accuracy is of the utmost importance. So maybe I'm not surprised. <laughs> A little surprised only 4% wanted a single channel. All right. Uh, at this point, let's go ahead and uh, move on with our presenters. Over to you, General Paz, for the intro. All right. And I've already mentioned Stuart uh, Riley, who is Director of Engineering at Trimble. He's going to explain the technical ins and outs and explain why only 4% of people thought that L, uh, single channel L1 was good enough. Uh, Stuart has been with uh, Trimble in Sunnyvale, California since the end of 1995. He's currently a Director of Engineering responsible for the precision GNSS-based technology used across Trimble, Trimble, as well as several GNSS product lines. Prior to joining Trimble, Stuart uh, completed an electronic engineering PhD in the field of GNSS at the University of Leeds uh, in the United Kingdom. And over to you, Stuart. Explain why only 4% of those folks thought single channel was good enough. Thank you, General Pass. I'll try. So uh, today, um, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, uh, dual band RTK. I'm going to start off talking about some error sources and challenges, uh, talk about dual band or dual frequency, as I, I often uh, call it, uh, versus a single frequency G GNSS. Uh, talk about why the pseudo range is so important and give you some, some examples there. Uh, some critical considerations. Uh, start to explore beyond dual, dual frequency or dual band into triple brand, band. And then some of the integration tools that uh, are helpful when you're, you're putting this type of product into a, a UAV. So uh, if you look at uh, 
GNSS or GPS. Um, what, are, what are the overall error sources? Well, you start with the atmosphere. Um, the ionosphere is, uh, is a delay, and it's frequency dependent. So if you have L1 and L2, you can actually correct it, at least to a first order. Uh, there's tropospheric delays. They're, they're the big atmospheric effects. And the satellites, uh, the satellites deliver ephemeris. That tells us where the satellite, or allows us to calculate where the satellite is at any point in time and what the state of the clock is. They, of course, have, have errors. Uh, and then there are biases on the satellites. Um, L1, L2 biases, and other biases in there. Uh, if you are uh, just using plain GNSS, uh, then inertia is not, not a consideration. But uh, if you're uh, trying to measure, uh, uh, for example, use, use GNSS in photogrammetry, you may want to know where the, the position is, the focal point of the camera. So for that, you need inertial. And inertial has a whole bunch of lever arms and angles, sign conventions, et cetera. It's very easy to get those, those incorrect. Uh, and then you've got the quality of the IMU, uh, temperature effects, age effects, et cetera. Then onto the, the, the GNSS hardware, the antenna is really, really critical to the, to the performance. Uh, what, are its, what are its gain characteristics? Uh, where is the electrical phase center of that? That's where you're going to get a measurement. Uh, that may not be where you think it is on the uh, on the physical UAV. Uh, what's its jamming performance really in the LNA? Is that going to uh, start compressing uh, uh, sooner than you would expect? And uh, and how does it handle multipath? On the receiver, tracking quality is absolutely absolutely critical. Whether you're single frequency or dual frequency, uh, while you're not using the SID range for RTK. Uh, directly, use it indirectly to resolve the integers, and I'll talk about that in a little in the next slides. Uh, and then, of course, the carrier tracking, which is the fundamental measurement for RTK. Then the PVT engine, so how good is your, your position engine, and of course the receiver may have some biases. So we start with the sort of mapping and GIS type, type accuracies. Uh, either autonomous, so this is where you're just receiving signals from the GNSS satellites using the pseudo range or the code phase, uh, and that'll give you something in the meter, five meter uh, level performance, depending on the quality of the uh, GNSS receiver and the state of the atmosphere, for those uh, ionospheric, tropospheric effects I mentioned. Um, you can improve that a little using uh, either local differential, uh, or SBAS, uh, such as WAS, EGNOS, et cetera. And this is a system where over a, satel a satellite link, uh, corrections are provided uh, to try and correct some of those, those effects I mentioned earlier. And this can, can deliver submeter accuracy. But for many applications, you want to go even more accurate. And that's where RTK comes in. So here, uh, you have the pseudo range, uh, which is represented by that sort of square wave there. And that's unambiguous. So you have a measure of the range to the satellite. There are some errors there, but you have an unambiguous measurement to the satellite. Uh, the problem is, it's quite noisy. It's on the order, depending on the receiver, from a few decimeters up to, to many meters. Uh, but then, Superimposed on that is a carrier phase. This is great because the wavelength for L1 is 19 centimeters, and you're going to get accuracy about a hundredth of that, so a couple of millimeters of accuracy. The problem with it is it's, uh, you only know where you are in one cycle. You don't know how many integer cycles there are to, to the satellite. And the whole trick with RTK is to combine those two measurements uh, to provide you what are those integers uh, effectively to the satellite. We do it a little differently, but effectively to the satellite. Uh, so, you, so you use the pseudo range to effectively set those, uh, figure out those integers, set, set that, and if there's no cycle slip, you can then position with the accuracy of the, of the measurement you're getting from the carrier phase. Um, so in L1, this is kind of a, a pretty complicated dry, diagram, but we've got three satellites here. You've got one going up the screen, one to the right, and one to the, the bottom left corner. And what we're just showing here is uh, where all those integer wavelengths uh, superimpose. And what we're trying to find is uh, where uh, where, where there are solutions, where, where, that, where it matches, that, that integer assumption matches the data. And you can see there are lots, lots in here. You've got the green circle here, which is uh, the truth in this example. We've got lots that approximately meet that uh, criteria because there will be noise on, on this signal. Uh, now, the green circle represents that pseudo range error that I talked about earlier. Um, so basically what you do is you use your pseudo range 
you set a, 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 a region that you want to search, and then you search for all these candidates and monitor that over time. The problem with L1 uh, RTK is because this nine, 19 centimeter, and because the pseudo range can be on the order of a meter or more in error, uh, you have a lot of search candidates that you, so it's very easy to get the wrong integer, or you have to s search and wait for a long time to get the correct integer. With L2, what happens is uh, you, you combine the L1 and L2 data, and there's lots of different ways to do this, but uh, simplistically, you can get an effective wavelength in the 80 centimeter range, and so then you have a lot less search candidates. And so it's much easier to, to actually identify what the real candidate is. Uh, it's more reliable and you get it quicker. So that's, that's just, that's in a nutshell, that's how it works. Now, the green, the green um, circle or ellipse I showed earlier, how, how do you set that? Well, that really depends on the, the noise of the pseudo range. So here's, here's some actual UAV data that we took a, a while ago. So at the, uh, on the right, you see the flight path, um, it's got some on this UAV there's some pretty sharp bank angles because we want to try and get on track as quickly as we can and so on the top plot you see the, the sea of and zero so what you're seeing there are the dips as it's banking a combination of some masking but also the fact that uh, the antenna uh, has a gain pattern when the elevation angle changes or the effective elevation angle to the satellite changes the gain changes and so you see those dips uh, but at the bottom, we see that the pseudo range uh, is pretty consistent across that and uh, across the data set. And here we're seeing 30 cent 36 centimeter standard deviation, which is pretty typical for a precision receiver. Uh, so what you want to do is take that, 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 that standard deviation and have three, four, five standard deviations would set uh, one dimension on, the, uh, uh, on that search volume. Um, some of the critical considerations for single dual band uh, GNSS RTK processing is really are you going are you post processor or real time? So if you're if you're real time, of course you need a data link. You can't go forward and backwards in the data. Uh, there's no data editing that you can do like that. Uh, versus post process, where if you're doing something like phot photogrammetry, you may not care about the real re real uh, real time performance, and you can log the GNSS observable data, maybe an IMU as well, and process that offline. If you are doing real time, then you've got a base station to set up. Uh, L1 RTK requires relatively short baselines because the ionosphere uh, will decorrelate uh, over a relatively short baseline. Um, so L1 RTK typically sort of a kilometer or so, dual frequency or dual band, 10 kilometers plus we can easily handle. Uh, but you're going to have to set that base station up or use some public infrastructure that gives you real time. Uh, there is another mode. Uh, Precise point positioning or PPP. Uh, Trimble has a service, others do as well. And this is uh, where the customer doesn't need a base station. You can get RTK type, type accuracies uh, using a correction stream uh, that, that the service provider, in, in Trimble's case, uh, our RTX service. Uh, so this is delivered over the internet or over a satellite link. These are a set of corrections. Uh, that allow us to do some similar processing to RTK. Fundamentally, uh, the, the algorithms are quite similar. Uh, and this can get delivered just a few centimeters uh, 2D in, in real time. One of the other challenges you'll have is antenna placement. I, I showed you earlier uh, what happened when you bank. Uh, EMI can be a problem. We see lots of challenges where the electronics are very noisy on a, on a UAV and cables and uh, are not well shielded that causes issues. Uh, code performance, I showed you on the last slide, that's really critical. Uh, how, what is the accuracy, what's the performance of the pseudo range or the code? Um, on a single frequency, if you're just doing uh, regular positioning, autonomous or differential, you can use data that's just frequency locked. Uh, for RTK, we need the phase information. So you, really, you need phase lock data, which is, uh, which is harder to, to achieve. You need a higher C over N zero. So you could have a situation where you're getting an ad adequate uh, pseudo range based uh, position, but you're not able to process it in carrier phase uh, mode reliably just because you're not phase locked enough of the time. Uh, radio link, of course, is critical if you're doing real time. Uh, you're gonna have some sort of comm link uh, for your UAV, uh, you're going to have to share that or have a secondary link to get the corrections over to the UAV. 
Um, now the spectrum, so dual band uh, is really the focus of today, but uh, GNSS is more complicated than that. So we think about L1 as 1575, uh, and a lot of us just think about GPS, but there are a lot of other systems that are all superimposed on that band. Uh, and GLONASS is uh, in a very similar band, so it's relatively easy to process it at the same time. Down at L2, similar situation, although a lot of the uh, newer systems aren't using L2, mainly because it has less protection. So a lot of systems today, uh, we're using L1, L2, and L5. So we're actually using triple band in a, in a lot of the newer products, and, and yet more are also using the E6, B3 band, as well as things get more complicated. Uh, so, uh, in terms of products, uh, you know, these are some, some Trimble products, there are many other competitors have similar sort of products uh, on the market, uh, but really what I'm trying to, to show here is the progression of the type of things that are on offer today. So you can start with a single antenna, GNSS only, uh, dual band, uh, in fact the dual band here has some, some, some of the signals are in triple band. Um, and th those sort of systems are pretty small, that's 40 by 50 millimeters, uh, that's a pretty typical size for a precision uh, GNSS receiver. Uh, then you can go on to INS systems, so the, the picture on to the right of that, the top right, uh, is a single, ba single uh, G uh, antenna GNSS dual band with an IMU that allows you to do uh, attitude. Uh, and then we have dual band uh, dual antenna systems that lets you get near instantaneous heading of the platform uh, and you can couple that with uh, with an IMU so uh, and all of these systems are you know the biggest here is uh, 60 by 100 millimeters so so pretty small and would fit onto a, a small to moderate sized UAV uh, we have integration tools. These are, I think, we feel very important to customers. Uh, we tend to put all of our tools inside of our web interface. Uh, that allows it to be cross-platform. Doesn't matter whether it's a Mac or a PC or a Linux uh, system. They are available when the, the platform's deployed, but really we're, we're expecting the system integrators to use this during their integration, and then often they won't get used. So we provide uh, tools for setting up the antenna. It's important that, to get ma the maximum performance out of RTK, that the receiver knows what antenna is connected. We have models embedded that can take some of the uh, elevation dependence out of the, uh, of the antenna. Uh, we also provide for inertial systems a graphical view of the lever arms. We find that lever arms are, are often incorrectly configured. Uh, either the axis sign convention is wrong, the angle sign convention. So, as a, as a user enters the the, uh, uh, the the lever arm, often from a mechanical drawing, it will actually show you how it moves from a sign convention perspective. That, that helps a lot of remove a lot of blunders. Um, and then uh, just my last slide here. Uh, so one of the other things is interference. Uh, a lot of what we see is interference actually from the electronics on the UAV. Uh, you can get situations where there's external interference, but a lot of it is due to poor shielding of the electronics. And so we provide some tools here, a spectrum analyzer like view uh, embedded in the web interface so you can see uh, what is actually happening. We also, if you've got data logging, uh, functionality. We will log a lot of this information. Uh, there's also a historical uh, waterfall type chart you see at the top right that will show you what the uh, what uh, of any what any inference has done uh, uh, since the unit was powered up. And so you can go fly a mission and then and then look at this data afterwards. And uh, that concludes my talk for today. So over to you, General Pass. Thank you very much, Stuart, and I think that was a, a stinging rebuke to that 4% that thought they can get past with just a single channel. That was an amazing um, description. However, uh, you did raise a bunch, of, a bunch of issues that would potentially impact particularly the small UAS market, and very luckily, we have Howard Laven uh, here to describe um, just how Micropilot uh, uses um, dual-channel RTK and how they get help their clients get around some of the problems that you uh, that you brought up. So Howard Laven uh, graduated from the University of Waterloo with a BASC in Electro Engineering and Computer Science as well as a Master's Degree in Computer Science. He is the owner, founder, and Chief Executive Officer of Micropilot Incorporated. 
Since 2004, Micropilot has been the world leading manufacturer of professional autopilots for unmanned aerial vehicles and has worked with more than 1,000 customers in 85 countries. Micropilot autopilots um, fly a wide range of drones from fixed wing, multi rotor, helicopter, and transitioning vehicles. Howard is also chairman of the board of Telpay, a Canadian business to business payments processor focusing on automated invoice payments. Telpay has been helping Canadian businesses solve their payment processing challenges for 33 years and process over $7 billion in payments in uh, 2017. So Howard, over to you. Tell us how, uh, how you use dual channel RTK in the autopilot market. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, General Poss. Um, uh, it's uh, very nice to be here. Uh, I'm going to start with a very brief introduction to uh, uh, Micropilot. Then I'm going to talk about some of the advantages of uh, uh, RTK GPS uh, uh, from the point of view of the uh, uh, flight control system. Uh, I'm going to talk about how the RTK is uh, uh, integrated into a typical UAV and then finally, how the advantages of RTK will uh, uh, help uh, uh, improve the performance of your uh, drone. So uh, Micropilot uh, uh, makes autopilots for drones. We make uh, professional uh, grade autopilots. There are about uh, 45 people uh, working at Micropilot. About half are in software and hardware development, a quarter in uh, sales and marketing and admin, and then the remainder are in uh, uh, flight test, technical support, and production. So uh, we make a, a variety of different autopilots, from uh, a circuit board uh, type autopilots to enclosed autopilots to uh, triple redundant autopilots at a number of different price points and with a, a wide variety of uh, functionality. We're located in Winnipeg, which is uh, uh, right in the center of Canada, and we are uh, about uh, 10 kilometers north uh, of Winnipeg, where we have a, a flight test uh, a facility right outside our uh, uh, offices. And we're, we operate under a Transport Canada Special Flight Operations Certificate. Um, a big part of what we do, half of our employees are involved in uh, product development, and we have a number of different tools that help us do that. We have a GNSS 32-channel uh, spirant simulator, uh, anechoic chambers, uh, 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 sophisticated hardware in the loop simulators, as well as a uh, uh, payload camera simulator. Um, this is a picture of the uh, part of our uh, production floor, and so a lot of what we focus on for uh, reliability is the equipment and uh, techniques that uh, can uh, ensure the best uh, possible reliability. So uh, we have a calibration chamber. We use a single channel uh, GNSS uh, simulator equipment to uh, uh, test uh, GPS. Uh, we also have uh, environmental stress screening to help ensure that all the solder joints, all the many solder joints on the uh, autopilot are uh, reliable and uh, as well as uh, conformal coating and underfill uh, equipment. We have customers that fly all types of different vehicles from helicopters, fixed wing, uh, um, multi-rotors, and even a couple that are uh, working with aerostats. So um, the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, is how the uh, RTK will actually integrate into your um, uh, uh, UAV system. And so, you know, the all RTK systems need some source of uh, 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 corrections. And uh, one way uh, that you can uh, get those corrections is to have a, uh, a base unit uh, next to your ground control station. And that base unit will send, uh, it knows where it is, uh, and so it can figure out the error uh, for all the different satellites. Uh, it's listening to the same satellites as the GPS system inside your uh, UAV. It uh, uh, sends those uh, corrections uh, to the uh, GPS system in the UAV, uh, usually over the same data link that uh, uh, you might use or that you're using for your command and control. Now, um, one uh, disadvantage of this is that the RTK base uh, needs to know exactly where it is located so that it can calculate the corrections. So you must have that at a uh, surveyed uh, location. Now, another possibility is you can connect to an RTK correction service. And that RTK correction service will, uh, again, uh, uh, via the internet, you can uh, uh, 
receive these corrections into your ground control station. Uh, then they go up to the uh, uh, GNSS receiver via the autopilot, and uh, th that way you can have your uh, RTK uh, corrections. And finally, uh, as uh, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, there are satellite-based uh, RTK correction systems that uh, will send the corrections directly to the uh, GNSS uh, receiver, and these are the uh, um, have the least impact on the uh, installation into this, uh, your uh, UAV system. Now, one uh, interesting variation on uh, um, RTK systems is the uh, moving baseline system. And in this system, you don't know your uh, um, absolute position. Uh, you just know your absolute position very accurately. Uh, you do know your absolute position, but the high accuracy is relative to a, uh, a some sort of a, a base station that is moving. So here the base station doesn't need to know exactly where it is uh, uh, because it's on the uh, moving vehicle. And uh, uh, this is used for a lot of uh, high precision landing and, and launch systems um, um, and is something that's uh, really only available on uh, uh, the higher end RTK systems. Now, uh, a lot of people, so some of the advantages uh, uh, of the uh, dual frequency RTK systems, obviously, the um, uh, position accuracy is a big one, uh, but but I think it's you know when you see the position accuracy on a, a spec sheet, it's uh, uh, it's a little hard to know what that means. So if you're using a, a cell phone grade GPS and say you're you're getting 2.5 meters accuracy, that would correspond to the circle on your left. If you use uh, RTK and we're getting 10 centimeters accuracy, that would correspond to the dot on your right. And actually, RTK give you much, much better accuracy than uh, 10 centimeters, but uh, um, uh, the dot would have been too small to see. Uh, in addition to the position accuracy, the better position accuracy, you also get much better velocity accuracy. And that velocity accuracy uh, can help you uh, with your attitude estimation. So the Kalman filter inside your autopilot is taking your uh, IMU data from your uh, uh, accelerometers and uh, rate gyros using that with the uh, position and velocity uh, information from your GPS receiver and providing you with an attitude so that your uh, autopilot can fly your or and navigate your vehicle. And the better that attitude information, the more accurately it can uh, um, uh, fly your vehicle and the better performance you'll get. So having a better velocity, especially a velocity estimate, results in a better attitude estimate, which results in better performance. Uh, another thing that has been mentioned is the uh, time to converge. Uh, the difference between single frequency and dual frequency uh, time to converge is uh, quite dramatic. But also, once you've converged to an accurate fix, you're more likely to retain that accurate fix. So if you're in a UAV and you bank into a turn, most likely you're going to have a constellation shift. Uh, so with a dual frequency RTK GPS receiver, it's very unlikely that you will uh, uh, lose your accuracy. But with a single frequency uh, RTK receiver, it's much, much more uh, likely. And uh, for the UAV to be navigating around and always having to switch from high frequency to low frequency, it's just not very good for the overall performance. And another uh, um, uh, uh, aspect, uh, and I'm gonna stretch the uh, definition of dual frequency RTK to include uh, all of the, features you get with high performance professional uh, GPS receivers is multipath mitigation. And uh, multipathing happens when the signal from uh, one or more of your GPS satellites, rather than going directly from the satellite to your uh, uh, GPS receiver, bounces off some other uh, 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 object. Could be a building, could be the ground. And what you get with this is some sudden uh, jumps in position. And um, this can be very concerning if you're you know, taking off, landing, or hovering near uh, uh, structures. And uh, the higher end GNSS receivers do a much better job of uh, filtering out these uh, multipath, uh, multipathing errors. And now I think it's uh, uh, back to you, General Poss, for our uh, uh, next section. Absolutely. And uh, I think, Lori, we've got time for questions, do we not? Can you confirm or deny that? Sure do. Okay.
All right, so we got uh, quite a few questions out here, and I'm going to, uh, let me just, um, uh, yeah, Howard, you did a great job of explaining it, but we've got a, an audience uh, question here that uh, talks about, um, uh, okay, given the fact that you're in a highly um, dynamic, uh, uh, and Stuart, feel free to jump in on this as well, you're in a highly dynamic environment in the UAS, you're constantly, you know, yanking and banking and turning. Uh, how does that affect the uh, PL PLL phase lock on some of these high precision receivers? If, if you're constantly turning, you're constantly moving, is, is it really going to affect your position this much? Howard, if you wouldn't mind taking the first hack at it, and Stuart, I, I'd be interested in your opinions as well. Sure, but uh, this is actually a question that's much, much better directed to Stuart. Um, I know how the UAVs okay. fly, but I don't know a lot Stuart, about uh, the uh, internal workings. Okay, talk to me. What is, is this a problem? So do you, do you want me to take this? Uh, this is Stuart. Uh, yeah, I, I think yeah. that was a hard no from Howard. So yeah. <laughs> okay. You got to save us here. So uh, yeah, the the the, the, uh, the acceleration, the dynamics you see on a UAV are really not not that challenging. Uh, for many many years, we've had simulation scenarios that we used to go up to six G in circles, and we really do not see any problems. We have a lot of margin. Uh, more recently, one of the things we do see on UAVs are some of these catapult launches. Uh, they, we've, we've instrumented them with accelerometers and see 6, 10G for a very short period of time, maybe more. And uh, so we've uh, certainly reviewed our tracking loops and can, can easily track through that. Um, one of the ways we've done this is to take missions, uh, post-process them forward and back, so GNSS and INS, get a truth out of it. And then rather than con contrive a scenario in a simulator, use that truth data into a simulator and replay uh, to look at how, how the system performs. So we've done a lot of that. Uh, other challenges, of course, are the TCXO. So very low cost, cost TCXOs. You're going to have acceleration. You're going to have some vibration. They have a lot of G sensitivity. So key uh, for precision unit is to make sure that it's got a good TCXO, which has low G sensitivity, and of course, while we're talking about UAV to, UAVs today, we've got a lot of experience in other markets uh, where you have high shock in terms of construction and other applications, and so we, we've used all of that information. So I would say for a well-designed phase lock loop, uh, UAV dynamics do not really cause a problem. Over to you. Okay. To yeah, well, and I think you just presented a challenge to a lot of remote pilots out there. I think they're going to all go out and see if they can't maneuver to break that lock, but uh, excellent stuff. Okay, Stuart, I'm going to keep you in the hot seat again, if you don't mind, uh, because we've gotten two questions on this. Uh, can you explain uh, the difference in accuracy between uh, DGPS and RTK, uh, precision nav, uh, uh, DGPS being differential GPS, um, uh, sure. code base positioning, and RTK being real-time kinematic. Uh, you know, what's the difference in the system shortly, and then what, what does that mean on the, on the ground as far as accuracy goes? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I mentioned some of this in my talk. So, so differential, this is where you're, you're really using the pseudo range, or we often call the code phase. And so that measurement, depending on the performance of the receiver, you know, we were seeing 30-something centimeters, 36 centimeters, one sigma, just as an example, we certainly see lower than that. Uh, you, I've seen receivers out there that have several meters. So that's, that's, that's the accuracy you have on that, that measurement. Now, you can smooth it. Uh, but the way differential works is you send some corrections from a base to a rover and you essentially assume that everything's common mode and cancels so the orbital error, the ionospheric, et cetera, et cetera. And so there you can certainly routinely get submeter, uh, not deep submeter, not, not centimeters, but you can certainly get uh, you know, 50 centimeters at the one sigma, maybe, maybe a little bit better uh, sometimes if everything's well behaved. Um, where uh, on a, a lower performing GNSS, you might be at the meter, two meter kind, kind of level. Uh, now, RTK, that's where we're using the carrier phase. So we use the pseudo range to figure out the integers. Then we transition to the carrier phase. That measurement, uh, the measurement of the phase lock loop is, a, is good to a millimeter or so. Now, you don't quite get that accuracy because you have multipath and other systematic biases and other challenges. Uh, but you can certainly get a, a centimeter or two, uh, 2D. Uh, you know, at a at a one sigma sort of level. So, does that answer answer your question? 
It certainly does. Very eloquent explanation. Okay, uh, getting a couple questions about um, what are the considerations in integrating precision DNS into a uh, into a UAV? And, and Howard, I know uh, you covered some of them. I just wonder if you can expound on that. Uh, particularly, we've got another another couple of questions about uh, antenna placement as uh, as a factor of that. And and I do know it's you know challenging as is to design a uh, UAS that can, um, you know, just just have a propulsion system and uh, you know a battery and all that. But when you're faced with coming up with additional real estate and grounding and shielding uh, to cover an RTK system, what are what are some of the considerations you're seeing with your clients? Sure. Well, you know, uh, uh, I think as it's becoming apparent, there are many different flavors for for GNSS, and so one of the really important things is to understand what your goal is. What data you're trying to collect and uh, uh, how uh, you benefit by the uh, uh, improved accuracy and make the choice of the flavor of GN uh, RTK GNSS based on you know uh, what your data collection requirements are but once you've got the GNSS and you're integrating it yeah there, there are quite a few uh, uh, considerations um, RF interference uh, as has been previously mentioned is a really uh, um, a really big one. You got a whole bunch of electronics packed very closely together on a typical uh, uh, UAV, and uh, every piece of electronics is an RF transmitter, and that uh, can not only interfere with uh, and prevent you from obtaining uh, uh, a GPS lock, but it can also degrade the accuracy of that uh, GPS lock. Uh, vibration uh, is another issue. Again, as uh, Stuart mentioned. The uh, crystals on the uh, uh, GPS receivers are susceptible to both G and uh, vibration, and um, uh, so, so that can affect the accuracy of your lock, as well as the uh, again the antenna. You know the uh, lower quality antennas uh, that you typically get away with with your uh, cell phone grade uh, GPS receivers are, are are not going to be appropriate for uh, the, uh, the higher. Uh, accuracy. So overall, it's 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 a more demanding uh, uh, installation, and uh, uh, but because of that, you uh, get much much higher accuracy. Okay, that's a great explanation. I, and I'll be honest with you, um, I you know, found with a lot of my clients, there's some just aviation 101 problems out there. Like a lot of folks want to go to uh, some type of non-conductive material for the body, vice lumen or whatever, and, uh, and people are just finding out uh, problems with getting their systems to ground, let alone some of the big uh, stuff that you mentioned there, Howard. Okay, well, uh, Lori, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're out of time for uh, questions now, and we're going to go to another survey. Did I get that right? That is correct, and uh, folks, coming up on your screen is that uh, second poll question. And again, we're asking you to pick your top two here. Uh, what are the most common issues that impact your position fix? Multipath, jamming, spoofing, atmospheric interface, or other environmental factors such as signal obstruction, radio interference. There you have it, 81% with multipath. 14 jamming, 4% spoofing, 40% atmospheric interface, and 63% with other environmental factors, uh, signal obstruction, radio interference. Uh, how that stack up, General Poss? Well, the important thing is apparently I beat Richard in the uh, in the argument there because jamming and spoofing are way down. Holy cow, multipath! Um, I didn't think it would be that that far up. I'm assuming uh, that's because a lot of folks are doing a lot of urban work and uh, you're getting a lot of multipath distortion out there. I, I, who knew? Well, we'll go ahead and pass it back to Howard. Okay, thank you very much. So again, uh, now I'm going to spend a. Uh, um, uh, a little bit of time talking about how the uh, better um, uh, accuracy of um, dual channel RTK can be used to improve your uh, uh, the actual flights of your uh, UAV or flight performance. Now obviously if you're hovering close to an object doing some sort of inspection um, having a better uh, position hold lets you uh, uh, remain much closer to that uh, object and also lets you collect data uh, more accurately about uh, uh, or know more accurately where you're collecting data uh, about that object. 
One, one place that uh, makes a very big difference is in the recovery of, or the landing of a fixed, fixed wing UAVs. Now, the uh, latitude, longitude, the position error from side to side doesn't make that much of a difference. It's really nice to always land your UAV with the nose wheel on the center line, but, but usually there's, there's plenty of room uh, uh, side to side. Where it makes a really, really big difference is in the uh, length of uh, a room, the amount of room distance you have to provide for uh, recovery. So if you're designing a fixed wing UAV, uh, you obviously want to make it low drag and to have a very uh, a shallow glide slope. And uh, uh, that's great when you're uh, uh, flying, but when it comes time to land, this can become a problem because it really magnifies uh, small altitude errors. So as you can see in this diagram, we've got two UAVs that, that might be at one of two altitudes. And if you see the uh, uh, landing position difference between those two UAVs given the same glide slope, uh, you can see it's quite a bit uh, larger than uh, uh, the um, altitude. So, you know, small numbers of meters of air can become uh, many tens of uh, meters of air in your uh, touchdown point. Now, uh, of course, there are other ways to get uh, uh, an accurate height above ground uh, uh, when you're uh, landing. There are laser altimeters and uh, radar um, um, altimeters, but these have some disadvantages. Uh, the first is, is that the ground uh, before your touchdown point is uh, often not smooth. It can be really messy to have to try and deal with hills and trees and other obstructions that are going to affect the measurement uh, from the uh, UAV down to the ground. Um, also, uh, especially with the laser altimeters, uh, there are environmental conditions such as fog that uh, mean uh, that will obstruct the uh, laser and will prevent you from having an accurate measurement. Uh, also, some types of surface conditions like uh, lakes or any body of water or uh, sometimes even very tall grass uh, can make it difficult to get a, a, a good uh, altitude from a laser uh, or a radar uh, rangefinder. Uh, another uh, important uh, um, uh, time that the uh, uh, higher accuracy of the uh, dual frequency RTK comes into play is any sort of a launch or recovery, especially if you're uh, moving at the time. So, you know, if you want to recover into a small net, it's uh, pretty hard to do that with a, um, uh, the accuracy of a cell phone grade a GPS, you need uh, basically an enormous net. Uh, or if you want to land your UAV into some sort of uh, uh, box, which is uh, uh, quite popular these days, again, you need uh, position accuracy that's uh, much greater than uh, the normal um, uh, cell phone uh, GNSS accuracy. Also note that in both of these uh, situations, uh, there are uh, lots and lots of um, opportunity for multipathing, and the consequences of multipathing are very great. If you're a few feet above your landing point and suddenly your GNSS receiver is telling you you're three meters to the left, um, could be a dozen end as well as you'd like. So, you know, anytime you're dealing with these very challenging situations, the uh, more professional grade uh, uh, GNSS receivers are very important. Uh, crop spraying by drones is also something that uh, uh, is much in the news these days or, or talked about. Uh, and here, it's really impossible to do a, a good job of uh, a crop spaying without the higher accuracy. So on the right, if you have a regular GNSS, the booms on the uh, uh, typical spraying uh, vehicles are, are usually shorter than the uh, uh, accuracy of the uh, GNSS receiver. And so you're not going to be able to uh, spray the, uh, the field properly because you'll end up with all kinds of gaps because the accuracy just isn't enough. Whereas on the left, you see uh, uh, the type of spray pattern or the ground track you'd get with a dual frequency RTK. And uh, you know, uh, minimizing the overlap necessary to ensure that everything's covered uh, is very, very important. And that's something that RTK uh, uh, accomplishes nicely. Um, also, uh, being able to do surveying flights without ground control points, um, not having to set out a whole bunch of ground control points uh, and survey them is a big time savings and uh, makes the whole operation more efficient. 
And finally, there's a type of uh, uh, GNSS receiver where you can use two uh, antennas and uh, it will give you a heading. And from my experiences, compasses are horrible things. Um, you know, you get too far north, you can't use them. Uh, the current flowing through your, uh, to your uh, motors will change your heading. Uh, even changing a payload or changing the uh, batteries in your UAV and you have to recalibrate your uh, uh, compass. And so by using a uh, uh, dual antenna, uh, dual frequency RTK GNSS receiver, you get rid of all these uh, problems and at the same time end up with a much, much more accurate heading. So thank you very much for your time and uh, back to you, General Poss. Okay, thank you very much, Howard. Uh, you know, you, you had to diss the one thing that I fully understood, which is compasses. I, you know, I, I, don't, know to, I don't know how to take that, but uh, anyhow, we'll, we'll just change subjects. How's that? Um, all right, and we're going on to uh, what is I think you're going to find is a fascinating presentation from uh, Jay Tilly, who is CTO of Visual Intelligence, and Jay is going to talk to us about how um, RTK uh, GNSS is so important uh, for getting sub uh, possibly millimeter level resolution 3D models made with their uh, propriety sensor. Uh, so uh, Mr. Jay Tilly is a former Air Force officer, a fellow that like me, senior engineer and executive with over 30 years experience in remote sensing, mapping and GIS. His expertise includes collection systems design, processing systems, and intelligent analytics of remote sensing data for government commercial purposes. Mr. Tilly has, has uh, held vice presidents uh, of uh, Resource 21, has been the chief technical officer for PGTEK and visual intelligence, and general manager of the Sanborn Map Company. He's also held many other positions across the intelligence, GIS, and mapping industry. So Jay, over to you. Well, thank you, General Voss. So I'm going to take you through a walk here from discussing positional accuracy, and but really focus on the market value of that positional accuracy and where accuracy plays in creating value in a lot of the applications of UAS systems. So as a, as a start here, uh, let you know that visual intelligence has been around for about 15 years. We are really a technology company. We focus in on what we call uh, imaging arrays, so arrays of cameras, and we've done a lot of work uh, both on aerial and, and UAS platforms recently to, uh, to prove out the technology and make it, uh, make it uh, a substantial contributor to the resolution and accuracy that can be attained from a UAS system. This, uh, this slide basically illustrates kind of the life cycle of what we do. We basically fuse cameras into what we call a metric super sensor. So we basically take uh, cameras that have a level of performance, put them together with multiple cameras, and achieve even better performance. Uh, the cameras can be configured in multiple ways, uh, color, infrared, uh, high resolution, wide field, which is one of the values of the array is because we can kind of change this out and and really trade off a lot of parameters that typically a single camera struggles to do. Um, and of course, multi-platform, be able to put this on different types of platforms that accomplish different mission needs. Uh, the end game, though, working through our software, is the product. Now, I'm going to be spending quite a bit on product uh, in terms of discussing accuracy and where accuracy plays in terms of value. Uh, to do that, I'm going to... Uh, First walk you through a workflow and then we're going to talk about the difference between relative and absolute accuracy. In this case, uh, data of course comes from the UAV and is processed in the field and that data includes GPS signals are sent up to our cloud processing system where all the magic happens. In the production engine, uh, we are able to take that data and put produce what we call a virtual frame. And a virtual frame puts an array of cameras together to make it look like it's a single camera but with the advantages of redundancy uh, in the solution for the virtual frame, we end up getting better positional accuracy as we move into 3D models and ortho products. Of course, uh, the point cloud, as I'm going to say a number of times, is not the end game. It's actually what you can do with that point cloud in terms of 3D models, uh, CAD models, and other use cases that then uh, get uh, have much more a multiplier value, I would call it, as we move into the various industries. 
But first of all, what's what is positional accuracy? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of error sources. We've discussed a number of those today. Uh, they flow down to these metrics that we like to call accuracy in terms of horizontal or vertical uh, or or circular radius, some types of statistical distribution, and we quote those accuracies for a system, uh, particularly in terms of relative and absolute accuracy. Uh, relative accuracy means I can me measure something on the ground. Um, so I, I've got enough of a calibration that flows down to ground objects that I can make measurements horizontally and vertically. And of course, absolute is where is it on the ground? Uh, these are very different concepts. They interrelate. Uh, if you don't have good relative accuracy in your data products, the absolute accuracy doesn't help a whole lot. So you've, you've got to have really good relative accuracy, and then you can really capitalize on the absolute accuracy that the dual RTK uh, gives you. So I'm going to be talking about both of these concepts as uh, we move forward in the presentation. The one of the key drivers, why do, why do we need millimeter and centimeter accuracy? As a matter of fact, uh, we talk about DOD targeting, and you heard numbers like meters earlier in the talk here. Now we're down to centimeters, uh, want to be able to make those kind of measurements. But the commercial industry is pushing us way farther than that. We're into submillimeters and millimeters in terms of our relative accuracy, and centimeters in terms of our positional accuracies. And uh, the reason of that, of course, is the information value that we're trying to relate from an image or a 3D model uh, to the value of that model in terms of uh, describing it as an asset, describing where it is, if we're doing maintenance on it, if we're trying to locate it, uh, trying to understand how to replace it. Um, we have to understand that physical object. And in many cases, that physical object can't be understood until we're down into the centimeter, millimeter range with any kind of high accuracy. So how do we get the high accuracy? Um, so in our case, we combine the sensor and the, and the processing to get good relative accuracy, which is shown on more on the right side of this, or the left side of this diagram, and then of course the absolute on the right side. To get to the high relative accuracy, uh, factory calibrations and infill calibrations are mandatory. Um, you know, UAS systems are not necessarily the most environmentally friendly systems. Uh, they tend to deal with different thermal and, and uh, different lighting conditions, um, and that has a, a substantial impact on these very small inertial mass systems. So factory and in-flight is really important. Uh, we calibrate every exposure, in fact. On the processing side, uh, taking advantage of the, the, uh, the image model, the interior, what we call the interior and exterior orientation, the distortion, correcting for lens distortion, extremely important if you're going to be getting accuracies down at the centimeter, millimeter level. Uh, we also have to generate a surface model because we have parallax issues, which means that we can't, uh, that we see things differently uh, through, if you close your left and right eye, you see things differently close up. Same thing happens on the, on the UAS system, so therefore we have to have a very good DSM. Uh, so we can understand the relief of the objects if they're a cell tower, if they're oil and gas, uh, Christmas trees or ground areas or any other type of infrastructure. We, we have to have a DSM. And then we do a thing called a virtual frame where we take it even further and do bundle adjustment of our array cameras to produce the higher accuracy. So all of that together um, is what's needed to get the high pixel relative accuracy. And when we quote things in terms of pixel, so what does that mean? So if we have a millimeter ground sample distance, or we have a centimeter ground sample distance, that means that our relative accuracy is uh, two pixels or better at that ground sample distance. And then we get to enjoy the, the uh, RTK uh, GPS systems, the dual band systems, and get down to the absolute accuracy that that relative accuracy affords us. So now we're in the two centimeter range for absolute accuracy as well. So you put those two things together, you now have a full capability to describe um, what a physical object is in terms of its size and where is it in the uh, where is it in the Earth. A major step to achieving accuracy, though, is your image quality because we're relying on the matching of images to to decide where a pixel uh, lives on the ground. This illustration from left to right shows a two inch resolution, which typically can be attained at two to four hundred feet but ground level with uh, you know, a wide field system, uh, getting all the way down to one millimeter resolution, 
on the, on this oil and gas Christmas tree, driven by the need to read serial numbers, to be able to measure bolt sizes, uh, bolt patterns, and uh, and so if we're we're trying to understand an asset, uh, we have to be down at this level to uh, correlate it with a catalog and 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 judge the uh, the uh, the type of asset to to high accuracy since a lot of these things are built by different manufacturers can be swapped out etc so image quality very important um, of course a lot of cases we're generating lots of pixels the time to process those and get to a meaningful answer is extremely important uh, this timeline shows one illustration of getting to uh, an a, a urban building and where the processing is automated all the way through to what we call a vector mesh model and so just to be clear uh, we have point clouds we have these vector models and then we have what we call an edited vector model you'll see on the over on the lower right side the path to that um, is mostly automated we do have to do some manual editing on our on our final model but the payoff for that is getting down to data sizes that are five megabytes versus many many hundreds of megabytes and the most important thing is maintaining the accuracy so as we go through this whole process we maintain the the integrity of the accuracy the relative accuracy uh, so that measurements can be made on these uh, models and the reason to get it done to small sizes so we can move these things around quickly now a, a lot can be done in parallelizing um, this is done on a Alienware kind of class laptop system. If you paralyze this in the cloud, uh, getting the minutes to an hour is possible. But the key point here is that uh, it's it's nice to have accuracy on data, but you got to be able to get it quickly. And so uh, those considerations are important too. So I was going to hit a couple of use cases here. Um, there are many of those. Uh, ones I'm not going to hit on is precision ag survey and mapping, which was uh, touched on a bit earlier, um, also very important for relative and absolute, as well as the DOE Intel use cases, persistent surveillance, tracking vehicles, for for example, on a wide field through full, full motion video or training and simulation, all demand high accuracy. But for this purpose, I'm going to focus on telecom and oil and gas. Um, and what I'm going to highlight first is the process to get there. Uh, what this diagram shows is that largely the, the after collection, the data processing is automatic. So the handling of the calibrations, the handling of the images, the image matching, uh, the corrections for lens distortion, the corrections for radiometry, uh, and then setting up the, uh, and you see here there's a PIX4D, we've used context capture, we've used lots of different uh, algorithms for our DSM. Uh, but it's all automated and we get to finally get to a finally get to a point cloud and then we move into our modeling space where we actually generate our mesh models and our CAD models. The CAD model is really the output product. Uh, the CAD model is positioned accurately because of the point cloud. We have absolute information, we have relative information and that's the success tool by which we can compare that item that we've measured to, uh, to a catalog. This illustrates that in a in a pictorial way. So from left to right, we have a 3D point cloud that's uh, made from centimeter imagery. From that, we generate a CAD model. Uh, the CAD model is positioned in terms of the point cloud and the imagery, and then is finally textured with the uh, with the imagery to generate a a 3D model. Uh, so the end end game here is the 3D model. Uh, with ability to make measurements. Now a key point to be made is the if you look at these antennas over on the on the right side, a lot of times you can't tell what that antenna manufacturer is or what its capability is until you look at the, for example, underneath there, uh, you have a number of connectors and cables going into that antenna. And the number of connectors and the size of those cables actually really define what that antenna is from a from a typing asset standpoint. So Telecom, to a large extent, is pushing the need for high relative accuracy in order to uh, order to type components and type cables. So, if you're wondering why telecom is uh, is, is pushing the envelope, that's that's a, one good reason. And of course, what we end up doing with this is taking this data in an interactive environment and be able to go into an asset system and be able to type all the components in the system, be able to describe what they are, where they came from, et cetera, et cetera, so that a, a, a maintenance plan uh, may be made or a capabilities plan for a tower in terms of what it's capable of doing is can be made. Uh, investors uh, 
and, uh, and others alike really like this information. Over to the oil and gas side, similar scenario. Um, in this particular case, we want to be able to read serial numbers. We want to be able to read gauges. Um, we want to essentially do an inspection down to the physical level. Uh, this is now is also a reason why we're pushing the millimeter, centimeter, and the positional accuracy is extremely important as well. Uh, we want to build a, build a CAD model that's good to centimeter level. And as you can see, there's a lot of rep, repetitive things on this, a lot of bolts, a lot of valves, uh, very repetitive. So knowing where those items are in space as well as the physical dimensions is really key to typing that asset and, uh, and being able to support uh, the oil and gas, gas maintenance life cycle. Uh, this shows an illustration of going from a wellhead that this was collected at about 100 feet from a UAS system. Uh, we have uh, designs that can go to 1,000 feet and collect uh, centimeter and sub-centimeter accuracy to produce those uh, well size. So it is possible to do it. Um, calibration, of course, and, uh, and, and paying attention to details on your UAS system is key to be able to do this. But uh, uh, we can cover that. Uh, and questions if you like. This shows another illustration of, of uh, the value of various types of resolutions and accuracies. Uh, in this case, knowing where all these various pipes are on this, on this, this is the frack well site. Uh, knowing where these are and what, specifically, if you're going to direct the maintenance person to go uh, fix something or we're going to replace something, we would like to do a lot of that stuff with the minimum field visits as possible. Uh, that's one of the value propositions is that the more we can do uh, from a flyover and help someone plan and architect their, their maintenance, their, their control of the site, compliance, uh, the less you have to do in the field, and that saves, saves a lot of cost. Switching gears to DoD Intel applications, there's really two major use cases I'm going to touch on. One is I call ta tactical image analysis. This is more of what we call a targeting case where we want to assess a site or a building or facility uh, to a degree to support uh, an operation. And then on the left side is persistent surveillance. Uh, we want to fly wide field but high resolution. Arrays are really good at both of these things. Uh, the wide field high resolution is great because I can add cameras. And as I add cameras, I don't necessarily have to compromise my resolution like you may have to do with a single camera system. Uh, but I'm going to focus mostly on the tactical image side uh, and show you some uh, value of that. In this case, we can generate a point cloud, which is automated all the way from collection, then automated to a mesh model. Um, you see that mesh model where these are all now vectors uh, that have had textures applied to them. But the key thing is maintaining the accuracy uh, through this. So there's constraints put on the mesh model to make sure that edges and, and everything line up. So we can make them measurable. And then finally, we get to an edited uh, mesh model. And this has actually had some manual work done on it because 3D models are never perfect. Um, they always have a little bit of, of, uh, of errors in certain places that you don't like them. So if you want them perfect, you've got to go in and do a little bit of work. So, so that's kind of the life cycle walking through of that. And the value of doing that is I can now make some really good measurements on a very small, size, small data size. In this case, we're measuring windows and doors. Um, we're also correlating the images to the 3D model, so you can go back and forth. So a lot of cases, the image uh, retains an integrity that the 3D model doesn't always do perfectly. So we want to maintain that correspondence. Um, however, the accuracy is definitely maintained. And things like low-hanging cables, uh, when you might not be able to see these around a building, is particularly important, which means that you're not only your resolution's got to be good, but your relative accuracy has got to be good, so you can make those measurements. And for if you're if you're a helicopter pilot flying this, you'd better hope that the absolute accuracy is really good, so you know exactly where that where that object is, um, particularly at night. Uh, so that kind of drives home, I think, the point that uh, centimeter, millimeter accuracy, both relative and absolute, are are extremely important. And uh, and we think that high accuracy is going to continue to push the value of what UAS systems can do. Uh, the availability of high accuracy GPS centers, sensors, the, the uh, dual band sensors that complement the relative accuracy of the sensors working together really open up new markets that are really demanding this level of accuracy to uh, satisfy a lot of their needs for 
automated asset management, automated uh, maintenance, uh, relative, um, I say virtual reality, augmented reality applications. There's so much more of that going into play right now, and you've got to have these, uh, these accurate models to do it. And frankly, it's really critical to the success of the UAS applications in some major markets. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to you, General Paz. Jay, thank you very much. <clears throat> that was fascinating. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Lori. We're going to do a poll real quick, right? All right. Sure thing. Um, let's see. Coming up on our last poll should see that on the screen right now. We'd like to hear from you again, giving you the option to select your top two. Uh, the most important factors in determining which position, which positioning solution to utilize are, and we've got their form factor, size, weight, and power, post-processing software, repeatability and stability, ease of integration, or cost. And it looks like we've got 48% uh, coming in with uh, form factor, size, weight, and power. 23% post-processing software. 61% repeatability and stability. 33% ease of integration. And 51% uh, indicating cost. Um, thanks all for uh, participating in that poll. And we're going to go ahead to our for more information slide. So back to you, General Poss. All righty, great. Yeah, and so here is all of the links for Inside GNSS, Inside Unmanned, uh, our sponsors at uh, Trimble, uh, you know, how to get a hold of their web page and how to get them on LinkedIn, and then we've got uh, emails for our, our erstwhile panelists there. So everything you need to know on how to contact folks all on one slide. Okay, so what is next? I believe we have another uh, time for questions still? Yes, we do. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go and put Jay Tilly on the hot seat to begin with. Uh, Jay, I know uh, that you uh, you mess around with an off-the-shelf Matrice uh, 600, um, but I also know that uh, you know high-precision uh, dual-channel RTK uh, nav is very important uh, for folks. Do you have any advice for folks that are you know designing or configuring uh, UAS platforms on how to get the best accuracy from their system? Uh, yes, Joe Boss, thanks for the question. So there's really, in terms of relative and absolute accuracy, there's a combination of things. I mentioned a couple of times in my presentation the importance of calibration. I think a, a lot of UAS users do not investigate to the great extent they can the camera calibration of their system. Um, and I will, I will say that that is just imperative to understand your not your focal lengths, your angles, your distortions, uh, and be able to put that in information into your correction software to get the uh, get the real value of that. So we do calibration, I said, on the ground and in flight, and even in flight is important. Uh, so you might take a few images and process those separately to get the offsets to your, your factory calibration, and that's often, often a big help in terms of creating very good, very precise point clouds. Um, another thing that's all overlooked a bit is image quality at edges. Um, the, a lot of the, the cameras fall off from their performance at edges. Sometimes it's, they're twice as bad at the edge as they are the center of their field of view. So you have to take a quick look at that and understand what your performance is there. Uh, I will say another thing that's often overlooked is the flight plan, particularly if you're collecting 3D models. Uh, us in the mapping side have come up, we typically like to fly racetrack configurations, uh, so your same altitude going back and forth, but in 3D data collection, the game is very different. Uh, you don't necessarily do use a racetrack application. You've got to make sure you generate one collection point, uh, or three collection points for every point pixel on your, on your uh, 3D object, and you have to be aware of the shape of your 3D object as you do your flight plan. So, the flight plan is a particularly uh, important thing, and then I want to really footstop what's been talked about already is EMI effects. EMI effects on the system can so distort uh, the, the capability, and it's not just the GPS, it, effect, it can affect your camera as well, and, and particularly in terms of signals, so you want to make sure that uh, you have done a good EMI survey of your platform. So those are, those are things that are in the recipe that, uh, that we have found have been most critical to, uh, to success of getting accuracy. 
All right, very eloquent answer. All right, Stuart, um, you know, I tell you, I was a little shocked at uh, how big of a problem uh, our audience uh, perceived multipath being. Can you explain how a high-end receiver is going to mitigate multipath? Sure, thanks, thanks, General Poss. Um, so, uh, well, let's first of all define what multipath is. So, this is where the you, you, the satellite transmits a signal. You expect to get a straight path, direct signal to the to the receiver to the antenna. Uh, multipath is where uh, you also get uh, that signal is going to also radiate to the surrounding area, and it bounces off a building, off the ground and uh, also is received into the antenna. So you've got the direct and one or more secondary signals with increased path to length. So it's always going to be a longer delay because there's always got extra um, path length to, to, to get to the receiver. Now, uh, for RTK systems, you've got two challenges because you've got the base. That's static, usually. Uh, and um, one of the problems is multipath for a static observer is actually the hardest to get rid of in a lot of respects because uh, if you think about the geometry, uh, when the when the, the satellite is moving relatively fast but it's got relatively uh, not well-behaved dynamics, and so what you see is that a lot of the bounds will be from uh, from around the antenna, from the ground, or things very close to the antenna, and if you work the geometry out, that's a very low frequency. Uh, change so the multipath that you get at the base has a very very slow time changing effect. Now at the UAV, it really depends what you're doing with the UAV. So we have properties of the code where if the delay is more than 300 meters, and it varies a little bit based on your signal processing and the satellite signal you're tracking, but if the extra path lens uh, beyond about 300 meters, it just doesn't affect uh, the signal so far. UAVs that are very high, you're not going to get ground bounces, but you may get some, some bounces from on the platform itself. Uh, also, when you're moving fast, uh, if that path length is changing rapidly, uh, the multipath is there, but it may be that the tracking loop smooths it out. Now, if it's zero mean, then it effectively is eliminated. But if it's not zero mean, you get a bias. Now, what do we do to eliminate the uh, multipath? Well, there's several things. First of all, uh, careful selection of the, the antenna. So for precision applications, we tend to try and use an antenna that only receives the upper hemisphere. The satellites are not coming from below you. Now, nothing's got a perfect uh, upper hemisphere reception. It will still receive things from, from below the, the antenna, but that's, that's the first thing you, to, you can do. Make sure you've got an antenna that's receiving the polarization from the satellite. Um, when, it bound, when the sat satellite bounces, uh, the polarization can shift depending on the angle of incidence and the properties. So that's the other thing you can do. Then at the signal processing level, uh, we have, uh, there's a very simple way to track the signal. You, 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 uh, uh, you measure a few, the, the range from a few replicas of the, of the transmitted code. You know what the satellite transmitted. You have a few replicas. You, uh, you subtract one from the other. You form an error function and drive that to zero. Uh, what we've been doing for 20 plus years and refined this many times since then is to actually uh, add extra hardware resources uh, at the problem and, and use some DSP techniques where we can look at deformation of the signal and from that uh, attempt to mitigate the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the multipath signal. So that's the somewhat short answer. So back to you, General Post. Very well explained. Okay, Howard, I've got one for you, and I have to admit that this one is near and dear to my heart. So um, do you see a time when uh, GNSS receivers used in UAVs are going to need to comply with the standards required for manned aircraft, like uh, the 0160 for environmental specs, uh, the 0178 for airborne software, or uh, DO 254 avionics hardware? And I would ask you to make a difference between small UAS under 55 pounds and large UIS over 55 pounds? Sure, and, and th this is a very good uh, question. And uh, uh, there's lots of, uh, uh, the whole regulatory uh, question and the certification question is, is still very, very much up in the air. And uh, I think that the, um, uh, it, it's still not uh, clear what sort of standards uh, are going to be required? But one thing is, you know, you're you're not just asking whether the GNSS receiver uh, needs to be uh, certified uh, because it's of no value to have the GNSS cert 
receiver certified and everything else is uncertified. Really everything has to be certified. And so, you know, uh, I'm not so sure that uh, the dual frequency RTK, that the, there will ever be enough uh, market demand to uh, justify the very high cost of certifying the uh, dual frequency uh, RTK GNSS receivers. However, you know, it, it, it's certainly possible to have two um, uh, receivers on board, a, a certified receiver and then your uh, a higher accuracy um, uh, a receiver. And that might be a much more practical way to, to approach it than uh, trying to uh, certify the, uh, um, the smaller uh, uh, receivers. So uh, th that's basically my view on that subject, uh, General Boss. Wow, that's a great way around it. I didn't think about having uh, you know two in there. I mean, uh, my, my concern is you hear an awful lot about uh, you know going to performance-based standards from the FAA. I'm not seeing a lot of those standards yet. I know you guys in Micropilot are, are particularly uh, ensconced in the, the DO-178 standards, but I remain convinced that um, for the large UAS, they're going to uh, apply generally manned uh, UA, uh, manned aircraft standards to uh, receivers out there, but I could be wrong. Okay, uh, Stuart, uh, we got another one here, and actually there's been a couple questions about this. Um, so how does a dual frequency receiver compare to a single uh, frequency receiver in, a, in an RF jamming in, uh, environment, something where they're purposely um, you know, putting RF energy in their vice, uh, vice multipath? Sure. So, uh, well, at a, at a gross level, you're exposing the receiver to not only L1 but L2. So, so you've got twice the vulnerability there. Um, however, uh, when you're jammed on L2, it doesn't mean that L1 is going to go away, uh, and vice versa. So, uh, so there is more susceptibility just because you've got more. You're open to more frequencies. Of course, if the adversity, if if the uh, if the attacker knows what frequency you're open to, that that really isn't isn't a, a disadvantage. Um, the other the other issue is the uh, the precision receivers do tend to be a little bit wider band. as uh, one of the reasons and one of the ways that we get uh, a little bit more performance. So those bands are open a little bit wider. That does again cause you some more susceptibility. Um, but some of the challenges you have are uh, actually upfront from the receiver. One of the challenges we see are the LNA that's in the, the antenna. So often uh, people will, will put in a very sophisticated GNSS receiver uh, and then skimp on the cost of the antenna. Uh, and a lot of those uh, LNAs really aren't very robust when the, there's a jammer. They have a very poor 1 dB compression point. And so when the jammer comes in, uh, the GNSS receiver could actually process it if it had a good good LNA, uh, but the LNA starts to saturate before we even see the signal. So, so yes, there is a little bit more vulnerability because you have you're open to more spectrum, uh, but uh, uh, but 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 you know we can counteract uh, many of those effects. So. Back to you, General Boss. All right. Thank you very much, Stuart. Okay, and we get time for one last question. And Jay, um, can, you, know, you mentioned 3D modeling a couple times in your presentation. Um, but n no kidding, how do you see specifically 3D models versus 2D models as becoming more valuable in the UAS markets? And, and, and really, how does this better data accuracy improve customer uh, data value? I mean, you mentioned it a little bit, but I, I I was kind of looking at a lot of your stuff and thinking, well, gosh, you know, couldn't a, a simple high-resolution 2D picture do the same thing uh, that you're talking about? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a it's a great question, and of course, to me, it's pivotal in terms of the growth of the UAS industry and particularly the commercial markets, including uh, some I haven't mentioned, which uh, are BIM and CAD, uh, and, and particularly in commercial construction areas. If I could use that. To answer the question, the alignment of a data set to a CAD model, so as built versus design, is crucial to be able, because we know that about 20, almost 25% of the buildings as they're constructed, uh, our structures constructed change as, as they uh, go through that process. A lot of decisions are made in the field are not reflected in the design. So the as built matching to the, to the existing design is crucial for uh, efficient updates of the CAD models 
and the BIM model, the building information model that goes with this building after it's delivered to uh, to maintain it, renovate it, and uh, you know, and basically, and there's millions and millions of dollars involved in terms of which is why BIM is now mandated in in federal in the United States. So, so BIM is one answer to the question. The other part I alluded to in the presentation is the asset management side, being able to identify objects. Um, really, very difficult to do in 2D. Um, as we if we try we actually tried that on the on the uh, cell tower side is trying to do 2D measurements to do and the asset accuracy that we were getting was pretty low it's like 70 80 percent when you go to 3D you're more in the 95 to 99 percent in terms of matching accuracies to your to your catalog now a, uh, telecom is not too difficult because there's not that many providers of it, of of components to that industry but in oil and gas a whole different story those measurements are crucial in 3D and if you're going to be matching it to an asset catalog and doing the uh, the type of virtual reality augmented reality you know work at your desk type of uh, uh, operation that a lot of these uh, industries are going to and particularly on the collaboration side. So the bottom line is that 3D gives you a huge multiplier leverage in terms of the value of that data set the UAS collects over the 2D image. Um, I mean, a crime scene analysis has been doing this for years very effectively in terms of using 3D from UAS systems and others to uh, to get that, <laughs> exploiting that accuracy. We're just trying to do it on a much larger scale. And, uh, and I think uh, as we do that, we're going to see huge growth and pull on the UAS systems as we're actually seeing already. Great answer, Jay. And I, and I got to tell you, as a man who just had a big hole in his roof found and fixed, uh, I would really wish that you would get 3D to the roofing industry because I had to call two roofers out <laughs> and one finally found it by poking his finger in it. And I think a 3D system would have found it. All right, folks, unfortunately, that's all the time we've got for questions today. I really learned a lot about RTK uh, GNSS and the, uh, the advantages of one versus two um, uh, frequency receivers. So I really thank uh, our panelists, Stuart, Howard, and Jay. You gave a great uh, presentation. And Lori, I'm going to turn it over to you for uh, for our final comments. All right. Thank you. And um, thanks all. Trust you found today to be of value. And as well, special thanks to our distinguished panel members and, of course, our sponsor, Trimble, co-host Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems. Thanks for joining us. This is Lori Dearman saying, hope we see you on the next one. Have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.